So if you've made it this far in your say machine learning journey, you've probably heard about functional analysis. This is supposed to be the field of study that underlies all of what goes under the hood of say machine learning. And presumably you're here because you want to understand that better. So then what is a functional exactly? It's more than just a function. It's usually a function on a function and it'll take these functions to scalars. One really good example of this is say, uh, the sample of a scalar valued function. So if you have a function and you take a few samples, well, we know say uh, the Nyquist theorem tells us how we can use these samples to put them back together and reconstruct a function. But each one of those samples is a functional. And you can have other functionals that aren't just point samples. You can have say the average of a function over an interval. That is a functional. The, the integration of a function along a curve is itself a functional. Uh, and every point that you get out of a sinogram of a CT scanner is a functional. Uh, there are tons of functionals and we're usually concerned here with uh, linear functionals. And so those are functionals that satisfy to say the superposition principle. And what we're going to talk about today are specifically continuous linear functionals. And we're going to prove the Riesz representation theorem. What this theorem does is it tells us that continuous linear functionals fit a very particular form. Every bounded or continuous linear functional over a Hilbert space can be represented by a member of that Hilbert space itself. And so what we have then is that every continuous linear functional over a Hilbert space actually just looks like the inner product against a fixed function. I'm going to go ahead and prove that to you. And we're going to start by looking at Rn. And Rn, we can actually think of as basically being a function space over a finite number of points. And where each dimension of your vector in Rn represents the value of a function at that point. So a vector then becomes a function. And then we can take this off to infinity and we can look at say a function on the integers. And we say a function is inside of little l2 if the sum of squares of all of its function values on the integers is finite. And this gives us our canonical Hilbert space uh, that was studied by Hilbert back in say the late 1800s. And then of course we can do this over continuums. And so that's where we have say big L2, which happens over intervals or even over the real line or basically anywhere you can sort of do integration, say the real line, a complex plane or any other area. And so all of these things give us sort of Hilbert spaces with sort of di different inner products. And there's a lot more out there, but why don't we go ahead and get started and Let's take a look at Rn and prove the Riesz representation theorem there. This is just your typical space of vectors equipped with a dot product. If we look at a particular linear functional on this space, we can very quickly determine its form. In fact, all you need to do is look at each basis element of Rn and follow the operation of that functional on that basis element. Uh, the action of this linear functional on all other members of Rn is the linear combination of these operations. It might be clear to look at this from a linear algebra point of view. The linear functional being applied to a column vector of Rn can be represented as a matrix with one row and n columns. In other words, it's a row vector of n dimensions. Each functional over Rn can then be identified with an element of Rn itself. And this matrix multiplication is just the Rn dot product. If we look at our first infinite dimensional Hilbert space, the space of square summable sequences, which is what Hilbert thought of when he first worked, started working on Hilbert spaces, we can very quickly verify using the cauchy schwarz inequality that each element of little l2 can yield a continuous functional through the inner product. That's a discrete space like Rn, but if we look at a continuum and consider L2 of an interval, we see a similar thing, again thanks to cauchy schwarz inequality. But the central question we want to answer here is, are these all of the functionals, or all of the continuous linear functionals? The answer being affirmative in the specific case of L2 was actually first shown by Maurice Fourchet in 1907, back when the study of functionals over infinite dimensions was emerging as a fashion. Uh, Ries, who was corresponding with Fourchet at the time, also arrived at the same result independently, but it seems that Ries was entirely unaware of Fourchet's own contribution here at that time. In the 1930s, Ries went on to publish a much more general version of the theorem, which applied to all Hilbert spaces. It's a really easy proof, and we'll show it here in a minute. So indeed, if we have a Hilbert space, then the only continuous linear functionals are those that arise from members of the Hilbert space via the inner product. This is known as the Ries representation theorem for Hilbert spaces, and is probably one 
one of the most important uh, theorems for all of Hilbert space theory. Now, let's prove the Ries theorem. Uh, pivotal to this proof is the projection theorem that we did in the previous video. And let's go ahead and remember what that result told us real quick. It told us that if we have a closed subspace of a Hilbert space, then if we take any member G of that Hilbert space, then there's going to be a unique member of M that minimizes the distance to that other function or other vector uh, over all of M. And so if we can find this minimizer, uh, that is what we call the projection. And we can also separate H into M and M perp through this representation where we take G is equal to H plus H perp, where H perp lives in the perp space of M. Okay, so this projection is very important for the proof that we're about to do. And the closed subspace we're gonna actually be dealing with is actually gonna be the null space of our functional. And so a null space is automatically closed because it's basically the function inverse uh, the continuous inverse of the point set zero and point sets are closed. Okay, so now let's go ahead and talk about the Ries theorem. It's actually done very, very quickly in Folan's book, and I'm gonna try to fill in a few details as we go. Okay, so I wanna to talk to you about the Ries representation theorem. I wanted to give you the proof. And so let me go ahead and redo what the theorem is, and uh, yeah, then we'll go ahead and prove it. So here, this is coming out of uh, Folan's Real Analysis, uh, Modern Techniques and Their Applications, and it has a nice little chapter here on elements of functional analysis, which I am reading from. So basically, this is what we have. Uh, if f is a bounded linear functional, which is equivalent to being a, a continuous linear functional over a Hilbert space, and so we'll call this f, uh, then basically it says that there is a unique element of the Hilbert space, so a unique vector, and we're going to say this vector is y uh, inside of our Hilbert space h, such that f of x is the same as x in a product of y. Now, this is a really remarkable result because it basically just says that there's a really simple structure to all bounded linear functionals, or basically any sort of measurement you could do to any function inside of the Hilbert space. So I, I think that's really cool. Uh, the proof itself is actually really, really short. I mean, if you look, it's just this last little paragraph here. I'm going to try to expand on it a little bit, and uh, we'll we'll go through it, uh, you know, step by step. So using my tablet here. Do, do, do. I'm just got a screen recording going. You ever use Good Notes? Good Notes is such a great writing tool. Get the screen recording going, and then we're in business. Turn on the microphone so we can sync it, and there we go. So we're going to be following Foland here for the most part, and um, and so we're going to start off. Uh, let's just go ahead and uh, write this theorem statement. So uh, if f is inside of h star, which means it's a bounded linear functional, it's just notation for bounded linear functionals. Uh, it means a dual space, if you're wondering. Uh, then there is a unique y inside of h, such that f of x is equal to x inner product of y, where this inner product comes from the Hilbert space. Okay, so that's great. And this is true for all x and x. Okay, so let's go ahead and start taking a look at this proof. Apologize for my handwriting. All right, so, uh, so to start off with uniqueness, it's not too bad. So uh, suppose that f of x is equal to x inner product of y and also x inner product of y prime uh, for all x and h. Well, then that's pretty straightforward. What we can do is we can subtract these two from each other try to show uniqueness, you need to show something zero. And so then that's going to give us uh, x uh, y minus y prime is equal to zero for all x and h, which then tells us that uh, y minus y prime and product of y minus y prime is equal to zero. And we know already that tells us that this must be equal to zero by definition of a Hilbert space. And so then that tells us then that y is equal to y prime. Okay, that was pretty straightforward. All we did is we just set x is equal to y minus y prime, and it gave us everything else. Okay, so now let's see if we can do uh, a little bit more here. All right, so we, we still need to find this actual y. We haven't found one yet, but if we do find one, now we know it's unique. So that's a nice way to start. Now let's talk about existence. All right, so we're gonna have two different cases. One case is f is the zero uh, functional, which is the easiest case. So uh, case one, f is the zero functional. Uh, this does exactly what you think it would do. It sends anything to zero. So i.e. 
f of x is equal to 0 for all x and h, but then that tells us that f of x is equal to x inner product with the zero vector. Remember, h is a vector space, every vector space has a zero vector, and that's what you get. And if you weren't convinced that the inner product with the zero vector gives you zero, uh, there's a dozen ways to show that. Uh, one you can show is that uh, any vector times the scalar zero gives you a zero vector, and then you can just factor out the zero vector out of this. So, you know, for instance, uh, you can have x inner product zero times any thing, so y, and then that's equal to zero, x inner product y, and then that's equal to zero. I, we just haven't proved that yet, so that's why I'm making that actual statement. Okay, so great. So we have the existence for uh, the zero functional. All right, so that, that's probably the easiest one you could possibly come up with. But what about the rest? Uh, can we do it for, for any functional at all? And the answer is yes, and we have to sort of rig up this funky little thing. And uh, yeah, so let's take a look. All right, so now assume case two, f is not the zero functional. All right, so if f is not the zero functional, then uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this set. So it's gonna be our m is gonna be equal to those x and h, such that uh, f of x is equal to zero. So it's the null space of this linear operation. This is the same as f inverse of the zero element and singleton sets are closed because they contain all their limit points. That is, they have no limit points. Then if you have a continuous function, then we have um, the inverse image of a closed set is closed. And so this is closed. And it is a subspace. If you want to verify that, then basically if you take, so if we let say X and Y be inside of M and A and B be scalars, then what we get is uh, we have AX plus Y uh, b y f applied to them. Well, if f is linear, then it's a f x plus b f y, and then that's a times zero plus b times zero, and so then that's zero. So it is a subspace. So it's a closed subspace, which means that the Hilbert projection theorem can actually work out for us. Okay, so consider m perp. Now, m perp is equal to uh, all those elements x and h, uh, such that uh, we have x inner product with u is equal to zero for all u inside of m, right? So it's the entire perp space. And what we know is that this space actually has to be uh, not just the zero vector. Every perp space has at least the zero vector. Uh, in this case, we know that there's another one because f isn't the zero function. So, you know, so if, if we assume by way of contradiction that m perp is equal to just the zero vector, which could very well happen, then this implies by the uniqueness of the decomposition that we get out of the previous theorem that m would then be equal to h. What m itself was the null space of f, which means that uh, f of x equals zero for all x and h, which is a contradiction. So thus, there exists some z inside of m perp such that z is not equal to zero, right? Which then means we can normalize it. So we'll assume you know, the norm of z is equal to one. If it wasn't, we would just divide by the norm of, z, uh, of that z and, uh, and then use that instead. So, so that's easy enough. Okay, so this leads us to our critical piece, the thing to recognize more than anything, and uh, that is this. We're going to set u is equal to f of x times z minus f of z times x. It's sort of this nice little symmetric thing. Now, we can note that uh, f of u is equal to 0 because it basically becomes f of x times z uh, minus f of z times x. Remember, uh, f of x and f of z are both just scalars here. And so these are scalars times our vectors z and x, and so we can pull those scalars out. And so uh, that is because we have, this is the same as f of x times f of z minus f of z times f of x. Right, so it is sent to zero by f. Okay, now what we could do is consider, uh, say the inner product between u and z. Now remember u was, uh, f of x times z minus f of uh, z times x, and then we're taking the inner product with z. 
Now, if I distribute this, now remember in a product, so linear in the first variable, so basically this gives us uh, f of x times z in a product with itself, uh, minus f of z times x in a product with z. And uh, well, this is just f of x over here on the left, because z in a product of z is the norm squared of z, but we said the norm of z was one. And so then we get minus uh, x times f of minus f of z times z. And uh, moreover, we know that u in a product with z must be zero because u is inside of m and z is inside of m perp. So that is equal to zero by definition. So then what that tells us is that f of x is actually just equal to x times f of z times z, and then that tells us y is equal to f of z z. I, just that's what goes in here, because that is exactly this guy. So, so then that tells us the existence of our function inside of our Hilbert space, or our vector inside of our Hilbert space, I always work over function spaces. And so then that concludes the Reese representation theorem. I added a few more details that he didn't include in Folland, uh, basic topology and Hilbert space theory and a few things he jumped over, but it's basically the same proof. All right, so, uh, so yeah, that's the Reese representation theorem. And so this is uh, along our journey in Hilbert space theory. Okay, so that's the Reese representation theorem. This is something I use in my own work a lot, and it comes up in reproducing on Hilbert spaces. It's actually what gets you a reproducing kernel. So it's a way of turning all sorts of measurements into functions inside of Hilbert space. And so it's a very, very useful tool. So this is part of my longer series on Hilbert space theory. And so I encourage you to subscribe or you know, like the video and all this other good stuff. And I wanna thank you for watching this and I hope you have a great day.